So I don't know uh, how many of you uh, watched the uh, royal wedding some Saturdays ago. Um, it was it was a fairly dramatic, r radical uh, departure from a whole lot of norms. Uh, and and uh, some of you may notice have noticed that the uh, the preacher who preached uh, actually used to be the bishop here. He used to have his office here in Greensboro. Uh, and uh, for me, the most radical part of the whole service was that he quoted Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. Now, I, I don't know how, how acquainted you are with the name Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. Uh, often people just say Chardin. Uh, but uh, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin was a Jesuit priest who died on Easter Sunday of 1955 uh, and uh, was excommunicated by the Catholic Church and forbidden to publish his documents. He was, they told him, we don't want you to print anything you write, uh, which is so, so, sort of a condemnation. <laughs> uh, so I'm reading from Chardin today. Uh, <laughs> And uh, I, I'm going to read two passages. It, it's a long, it'll be a little long, but that's okay. Uh, the first is uh, the, the passage uh, which I used as the front piece to my seminary thesis. There is no concept more familiar to us than that of spiritual energy. Yet there is none that is more opaque scientifically. On the one hand, the objective reality of psychical effort and work is so well established that the whole work of ethics rests on it, and on the other hand, the nature of this inner power is so intangible that the whole description of the universe in mechanical terms has had no need to take account of it, but has been successfully completed in deliberate disregard of its, re of its reality. To connect the two energies of the body and the soul in a coherent manner, science has provisionally decided to ignore the question, and it would be very convenient for us to do the same. Unfortunately, or fortunately, caught up caught up as we are here in the logic of a system where the within of things has just as much or even more value than their without. We collide with this difficulty head on. It is impossible to avoid the clash. We must advance. And part of the reason that I chose that hard hymn this morning was it talked about within. Actually, I was only concerned about one word, within. <clears throat> and the second, uh, so then the book that I'm reading from is called uh, The Phenomenon of Man. It was written in before we were gender sensitive. Uh, but uh, he's trying to uh, deal with the whole sweep of evolution. Uh, Teilhard uh, was the, one of the first people to lay out evolution as a religious uh, phenomenon. And so now he's trying to deal with the part about life, which is the point of today's sermon I want to deal with, crossing the threshold into life. Through a duration to which we can give no definite measure, but we know to be immense, the earth, cool enough now to allow the formation on its surface of the chains of molecules of carbon type was probably covered by a layer of water from, from which emerged the first traces of future continents. To an observer, even equipped with the most modern instruments of research, our Earth would probably have seemed an inanimate desert. Its waters would have left no trace of mobile particles even upon the finest of our filters and the most powerful microscope would have detected only inert, inert aggregates. Then, at a given moment, after a sufficient lapse of time, those same waters here and there must unquestionably have begun writhing with minute creatures. And from that initial proliferation, 
stemmed the amazing profusion of organic matter whose complexity came to form the last, or rather the last but one, of the envelopes of our planet, the biosphere. Those notes, sister. Yeah, <laughs> so this uh, this series of sermons, uh, so we must be into the sixth one now, uh, has been focusing on the history of the universe and trying to understand how we can see our own uh, life and our journey and our 21st century issues and reality in light of the story of the universe. Uh, I want to go back to Teilhard. So uh, I said about Teilhard, he, he kind of got uh, nixed uh, by the Catholic Church. And then uh, my mentor, Thomas Berry, uh, became the president of the American Teilhard Society. Uh, and uh, I don't know when, uh, personally, I ran into Teilhard uh, probably in high school. Um, but anyway, I kind of, this whole series is in that whole line of thinking. So uh, I want this sermon has four parts, like all of my sermons. Uh, I want to talk about what we know. I want to talk about what we say about what we know. And then I want to talk about what's coming. And finally, uh, so what, to, what difference does that make for me? And if it makes a difference to me, maybe it makes a difference to you too. Maybe not. Um, so the, the, the first few sermons, I mean, we were talking about galactic clouds and stars and all kinds of stuff. But these last few sermons, we, we've been focusing pretty much on the solar system. And now we're just going to focus on planet Earth. And uh, maybe five billion years ago, the solar system kind of got its act together, started spinning around. Uh, and uh, we're, we can't, we're not talking about Thursdays and Fridays here, you know. Uh, but about a billion years after the Earth had gotten its little act together, that's when we think another kind of threshold was crossed. The threshold from stones to life. Now, and that's, that's an amazing kind of little threshold there. I mean, what's the difference? What's the difference between an itty bitty little cell and a grain of sand? Well, on the first hand, it's a huge difference. Whoa! And on the other hand, it's not much. <laughs> and, and, uh, and like Teilhard was saying, if, if you'd have been able to take your CNN news team back four billion years ago and we're, here we are looking for life, but you probably, you'd have, you wouldn't have found anything. 
maybe, but you probably wouldn't have. So, what was going on? Well, this, this whole concept of within. What does it mean to talk about within? What's, what's within you? We sang that song about the love within, the joy within. The, well, that within that makes, you know, Linda want to find a husband and love her granddaughter, that within, that's, that same within is everywhere. It's, it's within little carbon atoms running around. Well, hey, let's a couple of us get together. Well, now we got two of us. And, and then, hey, we got a hydrogen guy. He wants to join us. Okay. Now, well, let's figure out how does the, how does hydrogen fit in here? And, and there's a, you can imagine what was going on on the planet back over that billion years. Little thingies looking for little thingies. And, uh, hey, let's hook up. Okay, let's hook up. And, and they, we don't know, but it's the same within that drives you to hook up with somebody. You know, you want to join somebody. You, you want to come here on Sunday morning. Why do you want to come here on Sunday morning? Uh, because there's something within. There's a withinness. That's everywhere in the universe. And somehow, some time ago, so let's say a billion year, uh, four, bil- four billion years ago, which, when I started reading that, I was surprised. Whoa, that's not really very long, you know? The Earth, so the Earth, 80% of the Earth, the time of the Earth, 80% of it has had life on it. Whoa, that's, that's, I, I stood up and took attention to that. But that was a fuzzy little threshold. What was the threshold? The threshold was that somehow or another, uh, matter got enough of itself together that it had the capacity to copy itself. Whoa, that's what that's what really life. What's the what's the difference between li- the little cell and the rock? Well, the rock cannot make a copy of itself. It, it can fall into, into two parts, but it can't generate another rock. But life, once these cells got themselves in, whoa, look at this, dude. I can get enough of stuff pulled together that if I divide myself in half, now there's two of us, just alike, or pretty near just alike. So that the universe crossed a threshold when it got sophisticated enough to be able to replicate itself. The universe became self-replicating. Whoa, that's a, that's a big thing. <laughs> that's, that's a real huge leap. Now, as religious people, I think you and I have a couple of uh, difficult jobs here. (laughs) First of all, we have to be able to have a theoretical picture of how can that happen. Now you can say, well, it flew in. uh, The first life was uh, flew in from, landed on a meteorite. Well, (laughs) that doesn't help us any because then you have to go back over to where did the meteorite come from and how did it get organized out there? Or you say, well, God's actually sitting out there throwing spitballs at earth or something. Well, that's not, we'll get that. I don't, we're not doing that. So, uh, uh, so we have, uh, we are now as a species, or at least the ones of us that, some of us, are capable of understanding this amazing thing that happened on planet earth. Now, right? It may have happened someplace else. Well, we don't know. And, and you and I aren't going to find out. I don't think. But we know what happened here. Life crossed a threshold. 
and cross the threshold uh, from being self-organizing to being self-replicating. That's a big. That's a big. That's a big difference because. We, I've, I've been talking in the last umpteen sermons, last six sermons, about how the universe is self-organizing. That is to say, let's take the solar system. Out of a whole bunch of explosions of stars, supernova, bang, poosh, bang, all kinds of stuff was floating around in this part of the Milky Way. And... One way or another, that stuff floating around got itself organized into a center that finally caught on fire. We call it the sun. And these umpteen little, eight little things, there used to be nine, but <laughs> Pluto lost out. So now there's eight planets, and then some other big things, and then some moons. And the asteroids and all that other stuff. But the solar system got itself organized. So that's what I mean. That's a good example of self-organizing. But life is a, is a more, con it's, it's self-organizing to the nth degree. Self-organizing with the capacity to copy. That's a, that's a big one. That's a big one. And why that's so important is because, for me, what that helps me understand is that that property, that withinness, that urge to pull together and organize and form more complicated things, that pervades the universe. And that's a part of everything. The rocks, the trees, and everything have within it the same urge that you and I sometimes feel within ourselves. And now I want to look a little bit at why, why saying that and how we tell this story, why does that make a difference to us? Well, the, the first thing is you and I are on a, a very special place in the planet. It's like we're on a special team. We are at a place where the universe has exceeded its previously known capacities. That, that is to say, when we look at, say, Mars. We don't, we don't think that the universe on Mars was able to create self-replicatingness. Self but here, we are sure it has. <laughs> Just we look. I mean, <laughs> you're fine on it. I, I'm now going to, as you know, I wasn't here last week. And uh, the reason I wasn't here was because, yes, last Sunday was my high holy day. It was the running of the Indianapolis 500. And uh, that's where I go to find out what life's really about. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> the guy that won, his name, his name was Will Power. <laughs> we, we spent the whole time, I wonder, I wonder if his brother's name was Horse. You know? uh, <laughs> but uh, Will Power is a, a, ra a professional race driver. And he kind of, uh, he, he didn't really think that driving just around in a circle was a very manly thing to do. And he kind of poo-pooed the Indianapolis 500. Now, the thing was, he was working for a man, Roger Penske, who lives and dies by the Indianapolis 500. So Will Power, some, a couple of years ago, decided to change his mind. And he decided that maybe he had a, affirm the Indianapolis 500 and practice successfully driving and, in, in, and in, so encourage himself to just drive around in a circle. Uh, and uh, he changed his mind and he won the race. And the point of this story is change your mind and you'll win the race. 
And the question is, what race are you in? And you are on a planet that is building life on behalf of the universe. And if that's not what you think you're doing, change your mind. Because you're on that team. You showed up here, and you're on it. Whether you like it or not. That's what the universe is doing on planet Earth. It's building life. More life. Every day. More life. And what is, what is life? Life is giving external form to the deep power of the universe. And the deep power of the universe is that there is a within. There is a within dimension. And you can't, you can't go find it with a voltmeter you know, and find a sixth. It's not like that. And you, you can't take a picture of it exactly. But I can tell you who's got, who's got, who knows they're within and who doesn't. They don't got no within. Uh, uh, and um, so you, we can spot it. And that's our job. Our job is to find the within and give it form. Because that's what the universe is doing here on planet Earth. The second implication of this, when we understand that life came about, and it came about out of stinky, swirly, messy seas, going bang, bang, bang against the ocean, getting hit by lightning. I don't know what happened. I don't want to try to explain the chemical arithmetic of crossing the transition. I don't want to get into chemical bonding and all that stuff. But you know, stuff evaporates. Stuff hangs on to little water molecules that go up into the clouds. Then they get turned into hurricanes and they go slamming against rocks and mountains and all kinds of stuff. And lightning hits. I've had lightning hit my house, buddy. It's, it's mean. Lightning does wild, wild stuff. Don't take it. Don't, don't write lightning off. Um, so you and I are on a planet that that's what's going on. And... The second, uh, an important part, the future is wide open. That is to say, before life happened on planet Earth, there was no way to predict what life would look like when it did happen. It was, it was hard work. I don't know what it would be like to be a super long hydrocarbon or whatever it was that was swimming around there and floating around in the ocean and bumping into other little super long hydrocarbons. I don't know what it was like. How does a hydrocarbon think, let's, let's get our act together here, dude. Let's make a little protective shell around us and then we'll live in the protective shell. Okay, you be the shell and I'll be the inside. I don't want to be the shell. Well, <laughs> I, that's okay. And, and it, it must have had, it goes like that. Like here, who, who wants to play the piano? Who wants to give the sermon? Who wants to keep the books? Well, somebody has to do those things. And if you're not a singer, don't volunteer to be the singer. And if you can't add, don't volunteer to keep the books. So, unless there's nobody else to keep the books, and then somebody has to keep the books. So, the future is open for you and I today also. I'll come back to this in a minute. We do not know what the next step looks like. But I'm convinced we are at a place on planet Earth like the planet was just before life happened, before that threshold was crossed. We're, we're at that kind of a place, which is exciting to me. And... Lastly, you and I are the ones who are making the decision about what the next step is going to look like. There is nobody, well, there may be some other group of people who are also trying to figure out what the next step looks like. They're going to take a next step. That's okay. But there's nothing outside that's telling us what to do. You can sit all day. 
You can do meditation. I'm all for meditation. And you will get insights doing meditation. But those insights are coming from that, that within that, that you can't measure. <laughs> it's not coming from some book. Though books are good things too. I'm all for books. But the future is radically open and it depends on you and I. Period. End of conversation. But, so then I ask, what is coming? That, la that reading that I did of Teilhard's, he, uh, he snuck a, a sneaky in there. You know, uh, he said, the initial proliferation f came to form the last, and then in parentheses, he wrote, or rather, the last but one. And, and uh, uh, if you listen to uh, 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 Brother, the preacher there that was preaching about love, uh, he, he, knew, he knew what Teilhard was pointing at. <laughs> Teilhard's big word is the newosphere. The newosphere. That is to say, when self-conscious human beings actually begin to function as a sphere like the biosphere or the atmosphere. What, what would happen then? That's, that's what Teilhard said. So, maybe, maybe the future, I'm talking now, my category is, what's the threshold we're at? Well, maybe we're at no threshold. So maybe we should just continue trundle along. That would be sort of like, that stands as sort of like, what about the carbon atoms that were in long strings that decided, you know, this cell thing is, is kind of a flaky idea. I'm gonna, I ain't getting involved in no cell. And so I, I'm going to stay out of here and bang against the rocks. Um, well, that's okay. I'm glad they did. <laughs> but the rest of them got themselves into little cells. And, and those cells were what became Sid and everybody else. <laughs> so maybe... Maybe there is, maybe that we're not at a threshold, and maybe if everybody just continues to be nice and live in their own little cocoons, we'll be okay. I don't think so. Uh, I think we are at a, a tipping point, a tipping point like an equivalent to when the cells got their act together in the ocean. And the way, the way it's happening is people are moving into cities. There's more of us together. And they did a special last night on TV about the, some town called the middle, they call themselves the middle of nowhere. It's a, it's a small town that's the furthest distance from any population center of over 65,000. Well, <laughs> up in Montana someplace. Well, you're not there. You're in a city of 300,000 people. And uh, we're all connected. And a lot of you got cell phones. Parenthetically, there were more people at the Indianapolis 500 last Sunday than there were in Greensboro. That's a factoid. But, and what were they all doing there? Cheering. Um, and some, some of them, there were other things going on. Um, so, you and I are at a time on the planet when people are moving together, like, like getting a cell, organ, a little cell organized. And, and this, this kind of community here is, is like a cell. I mean, we, we get together. We have some kind of rules. Uh, you know, you listen when I talk and, and that kind of thing. And you come here and we all agree we're going to start at 11 o'clock. And we get nervous if the person waits a minute late. And uh, I get to talk for so many and I'm going to run out of time. Uh, so... But we're at that kind of time, and this kind of a group is the prototype like a cell. We are to humanity what a cell is to the inanimate world. And we're at the same kind of time where there's a lot of experimenting going on. It's not quite clear what the next shape of the future is going to be. But it's going to be... It's 
It's following the same trend the universe has been following for 14 billion years. Get more complex. Allow the within to come out, take your responsibility, and figure out how to work together like a cell. You, you can't have everybody be the center. You can't have everybody be the shell. But the shell has to protect the thing, and the center has to vitalize and replicate. And so that's where we are. Uh, and this has profound implications, in my opinion, on you and I. Because we have to decide, first of all, are we going to get with the game like Will Power? I mean, is he going to really race this race, or is he just going to hope he gets paid? Uh, and we're in a, 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 a moving train. The universe is a moving train. It's going that way. And you got to decide, do you want to be in it or out of it? And then we got to learn, what, do we, what can we learn? What can we learn from the inanimate world? What can we learn from the geese and the dogs and the fish? Uh, what can we learn that will help us in figuring out how to get together? And what can we learn from science and the deep wisdom of our religious heritage? And then each of us needs to decide our contribution. And... By contribution, it's not so much what can you do, but what role can you play? And, and I don't think we have a clear understanding of roles that are needed in a, a group of people. But that's what we kind of need to work on. It's like, what if we imaged ourselves as a cell? Ooh, ooh, a little cell. And what, what are the different roles? What would you play? That's a conversation we can have. Maybe that's the conversation two weeks from now. And uh, then, finally, we got to work on this together. There's, there's none of us that have the answer to this. And just because you asked me to preach today does not mean that I have the answer. And I, I don't have any reason to believe that. Uh, but uh, each of us have a part of the answer, and that's what we're trying to learn. And how do we experiment? Well, so we have to share. What do you know? What do you think? How do you... And then uh, we have to support each other. How do we help each other? Now, come on. I think you got this gift. Come on. Stand up. Uh, blow on the fire a little bit. Uh, get the... Come on. We need passion. We need the within. And we need to reflect. Think back. What's going on? And uh, we need to remind each other of the journey we're on. We're on a long journey. Uh, it, it doesn't have to be ha finished tomorrow. But you and I are participating actively in shape of the f shaping the future. So uh, I I'll say it again. Uh, the, the real problem, the, what I'm passionate about, the challenge that I want to, that I'm interested in, is what's the shape of the future? And you and I are participating in that. And that's what I look forward to keeping to work on. Thank you.